Uh, welcome back conference delegates and to those who are participating online as well. Um, just a reminder, uh, the questions can be submitted via the attendee app by all attendees during the address and answers will be facilitated at the end of the presentation. In-person attendees may also ask questions from the table of the House during the question and answer session. We will now proceed to session 4A, the in-person address with question and answers by the Honourable Ayor McCaw Chuat. The Honourable Ayor McCaw Chuat is a member of the Legislative Council of Western Australia, representing the North Metropolitan Region. She was elected to the 41st Parliament with her term commencing on the 22nd of May 2021. She is the first Western Australian State MP of African and South Sudanese ancestry. Welcome, Mayor. We look forward to your presentation. Um, thank you, Honourable Nagra. I don't know if I pronounce your name correctly. Nari. Nari. That's fine. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land which we meet, um, the Wajak people of the Nunga Nation. I pay my respect um, to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to give acknowledgement to Honourable Alana um, Klos Koski, um, still still struggle with your last name, President. And um, of course, um, Honourable uh, Michelle Robert, even though she's not here today, she's a part of um, the team. She was here yesterday. And um, parliamentary um, staff and all the Honourable members, thank you for being here. Uh, my topic today is on um, pandemic responses and call uh, people in Western Australia, uh, people from the linguistically um, diverse community in Western Australia. This morning, I will speak um, about COVID pand pandemic responses by the WA government since June 2021. The compliance with the public health um, major, public health messaging, and the other factors affecting Western Australian uh, community members. The World Organization announced the coronavirus related um, in, in China on the 9th of, of January 2020. It declared um, COVID-19 global um, pandemic on the 11th of March 2020, a disease caused from a coronavirus. The crisis has resulted in a lockdown of major cities, as we know, towns and many hospitals have been overwhelmed by infected patients and death has occurred throughout. Currently, there has been approximately 245 million cases of COVID-19 and 5 million COVID-19 deaths worldwide. In Australia, there have been 130,000 cases of virus and 1,448 deaths, while much of the world has greatly impacted by the pandemic. Australia, and particularly Western Australia, have been impacted a lesser extent in comparison. This is due to, to the Australian um, isolation, international borders restriction, and the success of the state lead responses in eliminating the community transmission of the de deadly um, virus. However, the emergency of the COVID-19 Delta variant in June 2021, which was first identified in India, changed Australian COVID-19 landscape. The Australia um, entered a new pace of COVID-19 stress about managing a surge in the highly infections and trans transmittable um, Delta variant and increasing a supply and pace of vaccination. According to the international report of the Center for Disease a, a Control and Prevention in US, the Delta variant is as contagious as chickenpox with a reproduction rate of seven. This means it is more transmittable than MERS, SARS, Ebola, the common cold, the seasonal flu, and smallpox. The Delta variant um, was introduced in Sydney by limousine driver, most, most likely if, uh, infected by the US air crew when he, he transport, trans transported um, him. It is quickly spread in the New South Wales into Victoria and 
that means there has been a great lock lockdown, as we, we all know. The Delta outbreak in Eastern Australia has not been shared equally among different communities. People from the culturally and linguistically um, diverse cal community background have been identified as a group of at high risk of the exposure and trans transmissions. It has been known for a long time in the US, UK, New Zealand, Canada, that COVID disproportionately affected a cal community peoples um, all around the world. Cal people have a lower vaccination rate compared to a wider community due to cultural, religion, language, education um, barriers, and some confusion around public health messages. W.A. McGowan government is aware of vulnerable groups and their needs. Having, a successful, um, having successfully managed the pandemic from beginning and, and it was returned to the office um, on a landslide election, as we all know, in March 2021. It has continued successfully, um, but Delta, Delta variant um, has came back again. The hard work, however, is not done. The pandemic is constantly moving. Government and agencies and police are further developing network within the CAL communities to ensure the protection of vulnerable communities and a COVID-19 vaccine rate of 80 to 90% is achieved within the following month. When a COVID-19 swap throughout the world, the McGowan government prom prom promptly took a hard and fast approach which resulted in minimal transformation within Western Australia. When a case of COVID-19 was detected in the community, a quick and a short lockdown occurred within three to, to five days, which precautionary approach was wider supported by the public. These protective measures were introduced at a time when 75% of WA, 278 cases were linked directly to the cruise ship. A month of lockdown from March to April 2020 and carefully ex ex executed um, a roadmap to, to no restriction from April 2020 to June 2021. Demonstrated by the McGowan government success. The first case of COVID-19 appeared in Perth on the 21st of February 2020. It was linked to a return traveler. It was managed by authority and didn't spread the community. Further cases at break prevented by strict international travel, restriction implemented by the Commonwealth to non-citizens and non-residents, the WA state border restriction by the Mangan government, the hotel quarantine became mandatory for all the returning citizens from overseas. Since the beginning of pandemic, WA has recorded 1,100 and 12 COVID-19 infections. By contrast, news, news as well has recorded 72,371 cases and Victoria has recorded 73,151 cases. The McGowan government COVID strategies has saved life in our city and minimized the destruction for the Western Australia. The Premier, the Prem, Premier McGowan strong leadership has grown public confidence and, and fueled the state economy success. The McGowan government 2021 to 2022 budget shows that the economy is not only the strongest in the nation, but one of the best performing economy in the world. Remarkably, WA economy has grown by 4.3% during the pandemic. And despite the pandemic, being the biggest economy shock since the Second World War. WA unemployment rate has fallen to an eight years low of 4.6%. Though the COVID-19 pandemic has had minimal um, impact um, on the lifestyle habit of many Western Australia, the threat of Delta variant is real and is present. Has the outbreak continued in the news as well in Victoria? Vaccination is the best defense against COVID-19. 
vaccine like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, McDonald protect people from becoming seriously ill or dying if they become contrast, contact with the virus. The McGowan government worked to ensure equitable access to the COVID-19 public health messaging and the role of campaign encourages all the Western Australia to get vaccinated against COVID-19. In September 2020, 2020-21, um, it, it has launched in the newest press of the campaign and announced that all the Western Australia aged from 12 and over can receive COVID-19 vaccine. The result of um, the 2016 Australian census indicate that Western Australia is a multicultural state because of the long history of immigration to the nation. Nearly half of the Australian were born um, overseas and half parent who was born overseas. WA mostly um, culturally diverse suburb are Merubuka, Kundula, Gerwin, Balga, Willington, Cannington, Langford, and South of the River. For the instinct, 57.6% of households in Merubuka speak language other than English. A recent ABC report has drawn a link between Perth, affluent um, suburb, and higher uptakes of the COVID-19 vaccine. The city of Netherlands leads the inoculation disparity with 80.5% of residents having received their second dose. This is a 20, 20, um, this is 28.5 higher than the state of average with 52% fully vaccinated. In the city of Stirling, which includes the suburb of Marabuka, 56.2% of residents have received their second job. Whilst um, this statistic is significantly lower than the city of Nedland, it is important to note that the city of Stirling also comprises more affluent um, suburbs such as Colbinia, Manloli, Wembley. A recent study by the New South Wales Council for the Social Services found that 29% of CAL participants were unsure um, or hesitant to be vaccinated. 13% reported that they will not get vaccinated. They will not get vaccinated. Mamet Al Kafiji, CEO of the Federation Ethic Ethnic um, Community Council of Western of Australia, has called for more data to be collected about individual multicultural um, identity. He stated, beyond just looking at postcode, then making a whole bunch of assumptions about, about migrants living in a particular postcode. And this is what is happening to all the migrants across Australia. I think we need to be a little bit smarter about how we use the data. The Royal um, Australia College of General Practice, Practitioner has also backed the call. Dr. Billy um, stated, we could tolerate the care and tolerate the information to, to that particular group of individuals that may be at a high risk and or, um, or may be highly more affected at the moment. Currently in Western Australia, it is unable to, to capture data of vaccine rate among the Kyle people. This indicate that much this indicate that much of what is deducted through the data from 2016 census and vaccination rate by the council area are some assumptive in, in nature. In fact, state and territories have no legal obligation to collect any data on ethnic ethnicity um, except for people of um, Aboriginal or Terra Strait Islander background who are not identified um, by the term um, CAL. Accurate and consistent identification is important to ensure culturally appropriate services and to address the disparity in the health outcome occurring um, in the CAL communities. It is it is even more essential in the context of COVID-19. In the UK and some of the US data 
related to individual cultural um, linguistically um, diverse collected. This is to help to identify vulnerable members of the community, though allowing targeted and effective policy to implementation and monitoring. Figures from the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center in the UK shown a third COVID-19 patient admitted to intensive care were from a non-white ethnic um, background and a black patient were 80% more likely to be admitted in the intensive care. In Australia, call vulnerable, um, vulnerable um, variables include country um, of birth, language other, other than English spoken at home, and English profi uh, proficiency. However, in Western Australia, individual country of birth is likely only the data collected in the health setting. Given um, a recent surge um, in racism during the pandemic, there are concerns that cult people, specifically data, may be utilized to blame or shame cult people. Data collected, um, therefore, should be done with the sensitive sensitivity and confidentiality. The WH chart of multiculturalism 2014 and the Equal Opportunity Act 1984 highlighted the WA health system com, um, is committed to equal opportunity and diversity. The implementation, implementation of the CAL specific um, data collect, collection would allow Western Australia to access Equitable, equitable um, health services identified disadvantages um, group. The data outbreak in New South, the Delta outbreak in New South Wales provided vulnerable insight into the complex, um, complexity associated with the pandemic management and communication in relation to multicultural um, Australia implementation um, implementing cultural appropriate COVID nineteen public health messages in culturally appropriate places is culturally crucial to empowering CAL communities. CAL people that have lower health literacy are more likely to be vaccine um, incident and believe that, uh, believe in health are um, missed. Our old system approach involving st stakeholders at the various level is required to better inform and minimize the inoculation rate. Some call people obtain information and rely upon opinion from their countries of origin, from family members and friends, or news outlet that is spread misinformation. In this way, COVID mismaking spread within the call community by comparing translated um, COVID information on the government side having also always been accessible and appro appropriate for um, immigrant and refugee people with lower literacy and lower health literacy levels. This team from the original source materials in English not being suitable or translatable, not being reviewed to make sure information makes sense to the, to the CAL community members. New and emerging immigrant community are, are most at risk, has don't have established network to support them. Resources that have been translated are mostly for established CAL community, and they may, they may lack of tolerating um, in how messages and information are communicated. Government and health um, officials from various um, state territories and federal have provided at a different time, different health guidelines with regards to COVID-19 and vaccination, which confuse many people in the CAL community. The fear of blood clots have, have perception that um, the, 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 the vaccine development was rushed and is therefore into inferior and may cause them harm. Some believe that um, vaccine may important um, and in utility, um, others question of their effectiveness. Social media has been a big, big um, area of spreading myth among community, um, multicultural community in Western, uh, you know, in, in Australia. COVID-19 myths um, through Facebook, WeChat and WhatsApp 
we search claim as wearing onion and cloves or even taking HIV prevention drug will defend the body against COVID-19. This misinformation is read, is read um, the first language that are easily understood and shared among cult community members. COVID-19 vaccination fear are rooted in misconception, past history and mistrust of the government and authority. Senior lecturer in um, Islamic studies at Charles Stewart University, Dr. Zelia, said, when I say past history, I mean how polit politicians have talked about Muslim in the past, whether they have connected with the Muslim community, heard their concern and understood their um, dilemmas. An example from the Delta outbreak in Melbourne, nine public houses tower built as part of the past war salam clearing and looming over the inner suburb of North Melbourne and Flemington, where place were were placed into a hard lockdown with no warning. The lockdown was spurred by a raising number of COVID-19 cases in the towers and the evident risk from the overcrowded living condition. Initially, um, residents believed there have been a mass shooting at the towers. So dramatic was the circumstances they found themselves in. They were not allowed to leave their flat, not to shop, not to collect their children. It was felt as a massive assault by the community citizens in, in, um, in Eastern State. Very um, breathe an Australian born, born to Eritrea um, parent um, in Ethiopia, stated, for those of us born here, we work in the government in private industry, we contribute to Australia. We thought we were Australian. And more than that, we are human. And suddenly we were treated differently. It makes you question everything. It was an anonymous shock. WA has an experience difficult, um, difficult time, um, long lockdown of in comparison to New South Wales and Victoria. The McGowan government is determined to keep Cal community health and, and safe. Since Delta outbreak, um, WA health vaccination program has increased access to COVID, um, to COVID vaccine to the Cal community through the increase of vaccine supply and greater availability of the appointments. Vaccine are now available at the oldest state run clinics, targeted information outreach, and community advocacy among uh, CAL community members. A COVID-19 communication team have made translated um, resources available, and across agency collaboration has been a key factor in engaging WA CAL communities. The Office of Multicultural Interest, OMI, and WA Police Diversity and Cultural Engagement Unit have been involved in engaging with a delivery, delivering a COVID health messaging to the community. Both departments have a strong direct connection with hundreds of Cal community group and a thousand of individuals from the diversity um, background. In all, Cal community, local trust community, community leaders and representative plays a significant role in communicating with other um, members of their communities nearly finished, and have prevent um, to be positive ambassador of the COVID-19 public health messaging in Western Australia. Working in partnership with Carl stockholders and other COVID response agencies, and WA Health Department has successfully delivered um, a range of COVID-19 vaccine information session, presentation, um, webinar, Q&A sessions, workshop, and aim at a local CAL community. Given a CAL community member opportunity to ask questions, share ideas, and build trust, the WA government has engaged on COVID messaging with a range of CAL community organizations, CAL community leaders, um, faith community, and other key, uh, key stakeholders. WA local um, government multicultural network and CAL focus groups such as 
multicultural um, futures, umbrella of multicultural community care, um, multicultural youth Adv advocacy network, ISHA multicultural women services, ethnic um, community council, WA, Metropolitan, Metropolitan um, Migrant Resources um, Center, and support organization, including the Smith family, Mercy Care, Red Cross, Sabri House, Edmurai Center, and WA Council Social Services. WA Health has run a pop-up vaccine information stand at metro and regional community events with a high number of CAL attendees and is currently out of program of pop-up vaccination clinics across the diverse range of location in metro and regional WA. Many, these, many of these pop-up um, areas with a significant CAL population and in well locally accessible such as neighborhood, neighborhood shopping centers and including bannings, places where they do their worship and community centers. In concluding, collaborating with um, the CAL local um, leaders is a key conven convening um, to CAL people the importance of getting the COVID vaccine for themselves and their family to benefit and in improving the overall vaccination rate in Western Australia. It requires um, agent agency and yet time and dedication. It is important for the Magan government to continue to fill any gaps as it shows it can do. It is important to, to, to learn from the experience of Carl community in New South Wales and Victoria and abroad. As the member of the North Metro and the first African Australian woman to be elected to Western Australia Parliament, I'm, I'm personally invested in well-being of WA CAL people. I recently met the CAL community leaders to convey the important message um, of the COVID-19 message and that they have vital role in encouraging their members to roll up um, WA and get vaccinated. As FECC leader explained, the written translation are properly rich reaching 80% of the community. And that 80% is also properly English speaking people. It is the 20% we're trying to be, it is the 20% we're trying to reach who are the disconnected people from SBS, social media, but do not listen to their community leaders. I know car, I know car leaders strive to help their communities. They feel deeply um, res responsible for their well-being of their community. However, car leaders also require a greater practical support. Already, they have they ha they they and any members involved in administrating community groups, volunteering their time, and often at their own personal expenses. Therefore. What is required is a fun, culturally appropriate trainings and resources, not only to get messages, um, message out about the importance of the vaccination to the vulnerable members in the community, but to gather the information that may value the pandemic response team. Carl people are disproportionately um, affected by this pandemic. They are most likely to be represented in essential industry than other people. According to 2016 census, 37% of Australian frontline care workers were born overseas. 28% are from the non-English speaking background. During the New South Wales data outbreak, more CAL people were unvaccinated. They needed to leave work which exposed them to the higher risk and they returned to their home that were most likely populated by the family members where the virus was easily um, transmitted. This is not a scenario I ever want for the WA CAL community families. Many CAL people are concerned about COVID-19 and especially the Delta outbreak and how, many, and how it may affect them and their family and they want to do the right thing. But mixed messaging by the federal government and other misinformation has been uh, contrib contributed to ex exigency 
fear of authority has also contributed. As some of the immigrant and refugee has experienced a state harassment and abuse in other countries, cult peoples therefore require a repetitive, sensitive, direct um, messaging from the community rep representative they may identify with and trust. It would be beneficial for the leader from the multicultural community to be seen at the side of the government, health and the police official, and in the media. Then the trust will develop. When, a cult, when cult people see their leaders being respected, valued, and considered in, in this way, they become rep 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 repetitive to public health message and they are more likely to vaccinate and encourage other, others to vaccinate and comply with the public health standards. Helping to achieve WA 80 to 90% vaccinate vaccination rate target. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ayor. There was a lot of helpful information in there. Um, I think the, the clear one is all about the messaging and how clear it needs to be, um, especially with our core community members uh, often um, ticking a lot of our vulnerable boxes. Um, I will go to any questions from the delegates in the room. Cedra, could I ask you to uh, attend the table? Um, Sandra Karp. <laughs> Hello, Sandra. <laughs> Member for the agriculture region. Um, you spoke a bit about um, mistrust of government in the cold community. So I recently um, spoke to another South Sudanese refugee um, who's, who was talking about that very issue. And um, when I asked him about how that would be overcome, he didn't necessarily see that that was... Um, as a, as a possibility for some people, which makes sense. Do you encounter that same kind of resistance, like mistrust, even as even though you represent that community? And how do you think um, we can try and develop some of that trust to yeah. situations just like COVID? Yeah, um, thank you, Sandra. Um, similar situation, um, all the African um, refugees, um, Carl community members all around Australia, they face. Um, but what I keep saying to people is that let us, the leaders, be the great example to them. Uh, let's let's keep doing what we can do. Um, I was a great example when I got vaccinated. I got a few phone calls from Eastern State. I got phone calls from Melbourne. Two women called me and one of them was pregnant. One um, was breastfeeding. Her child was two months. And as you know, I'm a new mom as well. That was a really good way of me actually giving back to the community because I put my images out there in public, shared it on my own personal page, Facebook page, that I'm sure it has got few of the members that were like, oh, because um, some of the myths from the community as well that I have not mentioned is that, you know, um, you politicians are lying, you're getting fake um, vaccination. Mm. You know, that's not real. You are, you are having your own on um, personal vaccination, that is not true. You're just getting us to um, to be out of this world in a few years to come. So I think what you have experienced is what a lot of people are experiencing. Mm. And you have done the right thing by encouraging. <laughs> yeah. okay. I don't know if I have answered you. <laughs> are there any further questions from the chamber? Uh, I do have a question, Ayo, from online. It's from uh, Senator Sue Lines. Um, she says, thank you, Ayor. Are there any more practical steps that either the state or federal government should be doing to encourage high vaccination rates amongst calls, called communities? And she also points out that your point on data collection is a valid one. Uh, it has been a problem across all communities. So, yeah, are there any more practical steps yeah. that the federal or state government can take? Yeah, thank you, Senator Sue. Um, it's great to see you on for the last two days. Um, to be honest, maybe what I can say as a South Sudanese born, I think culturally, my mother wouldn't read a paper, is to really get um, people that speak the language to be the one that's speaking their language into the media, encourage um, their people. That's one of the things that I feel like the government maybe can add into, into to do list to really 
let's get out of the website, especially when you're targeting people that can't speak English, can't even write English, um, is to basically maybe target the community leaders through churches, through community events, because a lot of them are like in social um, gathering. Um, and really, um, really talk to them because a lot of people from the community still don't see the vaccine as something that will help them when, when the Delta come to Perth. Thank you. Mm. Is there another? Yeah. Ah, we have another question from the floor. Yeah, that's okay. It's better than reading the paper. Michelle again. <laughs> um, I really actually found that um, really helpful. But you talked about um, the capacity of having uh, community leaders at press conferences and, and in that sort of social media space. But you also talked about a cohort of people who are disengaged from their community formal structures and disengaged from um, other ways that that information might be shared. How, how do you get to those people? How do you get to the people who don't go to community events um, mm. and who don't necessarily follow the news broadcast every day? As, as so, um, like I mentioned, thank you, Steph. Um, like I mentioned on um, my other question earlier is to basically, if those people are the ones that speak less language, um, is to maybe get more of the speaking people from the community to actually pass the message but if we can't reach them what can we do um you know um but we have to keep pushing the message as the car leaders to um to really target more people um to get vaccinated but yeah that's that's very difficult but if they're in the workforce i'm sure um the measures that are being taken by the um, the government in western australia would help us in a way i'm not saying that um the government is not doing a lot. We are basically doing a lot, but it's just um, it's just the language and um, the literacy um, in in the community has has become a big problem and mistrust, um, as I mentioned before. Yeah. Our delegates, could you join me in thanking Ayo for a wonderful presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Delegates, uh, I will now invite the Honourable Jackie Jarvis, Member of the Legislative Council, to the lectern. Jackie is a member for the Southwest Region of Western Australia, and she was elected to the 41st Parliament for the term commencing on the 22nd of May 2021. She is a Deputy Chair of Committees. And prior to being elected in 2021, Jackie was a manager in Western Australia's development uh, in the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development and she was previously the CEO of the Rural Regional Remote Women's Network of Western Australia. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I will be doing, um, I've got a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm assured will pop up on the screen soon, um, because my wonderful staff did this amazing PowerPoint presentation. I'll be doing a summary of my paper rather than, than read my full paper. Oh, look, there it is, excellent. Um, so I am going to speak today about education and engagement and how the Parliament of Western Australia delivers community engagement activities. Um, I do want to start by um, firmly acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. Right. Ah, it's working, fantastic. Um, so what is community engagement? Um, it can, of course, feel like a buzzword that is bandied around, and, and sometimes we use community engagement as a bit of a buzzword to, um, to justify decision-making rather than to truly engage with our community. And I'm sure we've all seen examples of community engagement being used in many different contexts and not always successfully. Uh, so one of the best definitions I found that I like is from the Pennsylvania State University, um, which is in its simplest terms, community engagement seeks to better engage the community to achieve long-term and sustainable outcomes. So why is it important, um, particularly in a, in a jurisdiction where we have compulsory voting? So obviously here in Australia we have compulsory voting um, and so we may sort of ask ourselves why we need to educate and engage our constituency about the parliamentary process if, if we're already going to, to get them here voting anyway. It's my view that engaging our community is more important than ever. Um, we need to combat a current trend of political apathy and particularly in a jurisdiction where we mandate people to vote as soon as they turn 18. 
Having an engaged community is beneficial to all sides of the political spectrum and it is important for democracy and helps widen the number and diversity of voices heard in our parliaments. We live in a time where media consumption is at an all-time high, but this increases the opportunity for misinformation as we've seen in recent times. Um, and that misinformation can be widely and freely distributed and consumed very quickly. So having an engaged, educated and interested constituency adds to the legitimacy and transparency of our parliaments. So I thought I'd touch a little bit on how the parliament here in Western Australia engages with the public, um, and we do that in a number of ways. So tours of Australian parliaments are not a new thing, and they, they've certainly been the cornerstone of community engagement activities for many years. Um, and there really is no better way of having a parliament that is accessible um, than you know, by allowing people to walk the halls where the decisions are made and observe the processes. Um, here at the West Australian Parliament, we have a dedicated team providing education services and community relations activities that include physical tours of the building, the provision of online resources, outreach programs and collaborations with organisations like WA Universities, the YMCA and the United Nations Association of WA and we also host a number of special events. Uh, probably the cornerstone of this is our student tours. So the WA Parliament welcomes around 25,000 visitors each year to Parliament and up to 19,000 of these visitors are students. On sitting days, um, our students will tour Parliament House. They'll observe debates and they'll meet their local members and sometimes they'll, they'll enjoy uh, morning or afternoon tea or lunch with their local members. On non-sitting days, students enter this either this chamber here, the Legislative Assembly Chamber or a Legislative Council Chamber and they actually role play activities um, considering bills that have passed, actual bills that have passed the House and the WA Parliament. And our education team take great care to ensure the bills are appropriate for the age and lived experience of those students. As an example, um, students who are aged around 10 or 11 years old might consider the CAT Bill of 2011. The CAT Bill was aimed at protecting native animals from stray or feral cats. Um, sorry, I wasn't in the house for that one. <laughs> Um, students aged 15, uh, 12 to 15 years um, may consider the cr Criminal Code Amendment, the Graffiti Bill, which was introduced to combat graffiti, increasing issue of graffiti in our community. And students in their final years of school, and these in Western Australia are students aged 16 through to 18 years old, may consider legislation relevant to the navigation of dig digital technology and new relationships in the Intimate Images Bill of, of 2018, which criminalises the distribution um, or threatened distribution of intimate images, this so-called revenge porn. The parliamentary education officers do a fantastic job, not of just ensuring that the, the um, lessons are uh, age appropriate, but they also make sure that the, the lessons and the engagement activities extend much further than the 75 minute tour. Um, and prior to visiting school, right, prior, apologies to visiting parliament, schools receive curriculum supported, um, curriculum support tailored um, to the age of the students so that those lessons can continue in um, before visiting parliament and afterwards. And I've just done a screenshot there of some of the online resources. This is our public facing website here in Western Australia. Um, there's links to education resources. We've got uh, workbooks and videos. Um, and for new members of parliament like myself, um, on our, our intranet we actually also have um, uh, video opportunities to see people doing uh, different things in the house so that we can actually understand uh, what we're doing when we first get here. A fantastic initiative is the pop-up parliament. So Western Australia is a state that has a land mass of over 2.6 million square kilometres. Um, so it is obviously not possible to have students all come to Perth to attend Parliament. And so whilst we welcome students and the members of the community, it, it's simply not a reality for people who live a significant distance. So this fantastic initiative, the pop-up Parliament, um, sees teams visit regional WA each parliamentary term. There are three week-long outreach visits held each year. Um, and thankfully, because we've, we um, haven't had the lockdowns that we've seen in other states, we've had to continue this program through 2021. Uh, the program is aimed at students from year five, so students around 10 years old, right through to upper secondary school. And teachers can also attend professional learning opportunities and there's also community workshops. And again, another fantastic initiative for teachers who are obviously in, um, in regional areas that might not get those uh, professional development opportunities as readily.
Uh, local members of parliament are also invited along to in, in answer any questions. In 2021, the pop-up parliament um, has been held in three locations already. So in Esperance, and for those of you um, who are visitors to the state, Esperance is almost 700 kilometres southeast of Perth. It is right down on our bottom uh, southern coast there. They've also attended the town of Broome, um, which is more than 2,000 kilometres north of Perth, and the regional city of Albany, about 400 kilometres south of Perth. Just these three town visits alone, 19 schools were visited across the three locations. Uh, 74 sessions were held and it was delivered to more than 2,000 students in addition to the engagement with the teachers and the communities. Um, we also um, have tours on offer to the general public. We have scheduled public tours twice a week that anyone can join. Community groups can also book their own tour time for an hour long tour. The Talk and Tour program includes a 30-minute talk um, on a selected range of topics, followed by a morning tea or afternoon tea and a 45-minute tour of Parliament. Um, and the Parliament of Western Australia ho also holds one of the largest art collections of any state parliament in Australia. And we have experienced guides from the Art Gallery of Western Australia who come in and deliver twice monthly art tours. And I haven't got on the list, but I believe, do we do tours of the garden as well, I believe? I think we might, no? Oh, well, that, lucky I didn't put it on the list. <laughs> you can wander around the garden yourself. It's lovely. <laughs> ah, they can be arranged. <laughs> Um, we also host um, have another of collaborations, programs and special events um, and it's a great way to strengthen community, uh, strengthen connection to community through both our own programs, ones that we host with others, collaborations. Um, so the Parliamentary Education team, which is based here in Parliament, um, run a couple of programs. There's a statewide student parliament and this aims to um, educate students on the parliamentary system of government as students approach voting age. The Parliamentary Research Program. The Parliamentary Research Program is a collaboration between Parliament and WA universities and it's where tertiary students um, undertake a research project under the guidance of a Member of Parliament. And a number of the papers I have researched and referenced in, in my paper that will be uploaded um, have come from this program. So there are young researchers um, doing an amazing amount of work on, on research programs looking at parliaments. The WA Parliament also hosts the YMCA Youth Parliament, uh, which is a week-long annual program which provides people aged 15 to 25 years an opportunity to develop personal skills and learn about the political process. And they will spend the week in Parliament. They'll um, all be allocated a ministerial portfolio or an electorate. And quite often um, members of Parliament will actually sponsor those places for those students. The United Nations Association of WA runs the Tomorrow's Citizens Leadership Leaders Program, which is also held here in Parliament, and that's for students aged 10 to 17 years, and it's a one-day leadership program focused on the UN Global Goals delivered at Parliament House. Another way that, that members of Parliament here in WA seek to connect to the community is through an initiative called Parliamentary Friendship Groups, and I'm sure there are many um, parliaments around Australia and around the Pacific that do similar. Um, these are informal groups established by members of Parliament um, to raise awareness or increase liaison with a particular group or issue. Just in the last few weeks, we've had two new Parliamentary Friendship Groups launched here in Western Australia. We've had the Parliamentary Friendship Group of Parents Raising Their Grandchildren and the Parliamentary Friends of People with Rare and Undiagnosed Diseases. And as I said, both new um, groups were launched only in the last few weeks. Uh, from my understanding, there's currently 10 friendship groups um, here in WA Parliament and they represent a diverse range of interests. We have Parliamentary Friends of Refugees, Parliamentary Friends of Cricket, I believe there's one of Friends of Netball, um, Parliamentary Friends of Veterans and Veterans Families, and just to name a few, um, which is, as I said, fantastic initiative and a great way to engage with the broader community. The WA Parliament also creates engagement opportunities around significant events or dates. And um, you've heard us all, we're all very proud, I think, to be bragging that the first female politician in Australia was here in Western Australia. So this year does commemorate the Edith Cowan centenary. Um, and there's been a number of events. So um, Edith Cowan was elected in uh, 1921. And our WA Parliament education team created a, a range of online resources. 
They also acknowledge uh, Edith Cowan's achievements during tours. Um, they've commissioned a special commemorative badge for students. So all students who come to our student tours or, or take part in our pop-up parliament receive a commemorative badge. Um, there's a school video competition that's currently running. Um, and probably the one I like the most is we actually had a dramatic performance. So we had a theatre piece that was actually performed here in this chamber, in the Chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where we had a, a recreation of the, um, her first speech, uh, complete with interjections. So um, I know that that is now common practice that, that we don't have interjections on people's inaugural speech, uh, but in uh, Edith's day, they were many and they were incredibly dismissive and incredibly rude. So we, it was fantastic. The general public sat in here and could actually see that happen in real time. And so the image up the top is the, um, is the actress who, who played Edith Cowan in that, in that um, dramatic performance. So fantastic way to engage with the general public. Um, of course, social media and digital technology. Um, so WA Parliament broadcasts the parliamentary sittings live, um, and I, you know, I believe uh, my colleague uh, Donald Lorna Harper has her husband watching. And <laughs> we've also had some new MPs where their mothers have been texting them saying, "Why have you left the chamber?" <laughs> So um, parliamentary sittings are, are streamed live. Um, there's a video gallery directed to all the sittings and speeches from both chambers. The WA Parliament has its own uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts and we have separate Legislative Assembly and Legislative Council social media sites so they can give updates on news, happenings and the introduction and passage of bills. Um, obviously, most um, members of parliament have embraced the need to connect with the community. Um, most have a Facebook page. Um, many have Instagram. Um, some have Twitter. Uh, some actually have YouTube channels where they can actually put in snippets of their speeches um, on their own YouTube channel. I know the Honourable Sandra Carr is very good at doing that. Um, uh, and um, uh, our Premier Mark McGann has a TikTok account, which I think probably 12 months ago would have been um, unheard of. So the question is, does compulsory voting automatically build a greater connection to community? So Australia is one of only 29 countries where voting is compulsory. And we do tell ourselves it's a great equaliser and ensures our constituents are connected to parliament and the democratic process. Compulsory voting does drive a high level of participation and we tend to believe that political systems with high levels of participation are more representative of the electorate as a whole. But are these voters truly engaged in an, elect in an electorate where it is a finable offence not to vote? Um, I talked before about the parliamentary research internship. Um, there's a 2012 paper that was written by one of these students, Amy uh, Prakilio, um, who fittingly was a student at the WA's uh, Edith Cowan University. Um, so Amy's research paper was titled Compulsory Voting. Does it keep the community at large more connected and have first world countries forgotten the value of the vote? In her research, Amy notes, emphasis on civic duty and political equality is ingrained in Australian political culture, largely due to laws that uphold voting, not merely as a right, but as a duty to be exert exercised by all citizens for the benefit of society. She goes on to note though, Compulsory voting does not produce the perfect democracy. Several components of society remain disengaged and apathetic to the political representation. So in countries where vote, voting isn't compulsory, it is obviously quite clear if people are engaged to the process or are disillusioned based simply on voter turnout. In Australia, we can perhaps consider enrolment data and the rate of informal votes to measure engagement or apathy amongst voters. Now, informal votes can comprise of two things. Informal votes can be those ballot papers that are just simply left blank. Um, and then we have ballot papers that are filled out but not completely, but not completed correctly and are therefore invalid. Research would suggest that it's these blank ballot papers that are reflective of apathetic voters. That is, enrolled voters who have turned up to the polling booth to avoid a fine but have then deliberately left their ballot paper blank. But the most common form of informal votes, however, are invalid votes, the votes that have not been filled out correctly rather than just left completely blank. And it's hard to know whether these invalid votes suggest voter apathy or if they could also 
misunderstanding the pre preferential voting system or perhaps have language or other barriers that are impacting their ability to vote, um, to, to lodge a valid vote. At the 2021 state election here in Western Australia in March, 3.76% of votes were classed as informal. But the rate of those that were left blank or incorrectly completed was not readily available. Now, I want to reflect on the impact of these um, invalid votes, um, informal votes, um, based on our last two seats that were declared at the March election. So um, we have my, my colleague, Christine Tonkin, here, um, who, as she mentioned, won the seat for Churchlands, a seat that was not traditionally expected to be won by a Labor candidate. So um, the seat of Churchlands was not um, announced as until the Wednesday after the election, um, and it's because it was so close. So um, Christine Tonkin won the seat by 408 votes on a, a two-party preferred basis. The number of formal votes in Churchlands was 715. The seat of Warren Blackwood in the southwest where I live, so it's a regional seat traditionally held by the National Party. Um, the Labor candidate, Jane Kelsby, won that seat. That was also announced the Wednesday after the election. Jane Kelsby won that seat by 637 votes on a two-party preferred basis. And yet in that electorate, there were 994 informal votes. So you can see that the number of people in voting informally makes us, can make a significant difference to, um, to who wins the seat. On top of the informal votes, we have a percentage of people eligible to vote, to vote who are not enrolled and so clearly are not engaged in the electoral process. Um, and for, for anyone who may not be in Australia, so whilst it is compulsory to vote in Australia from the age of 18, people are not automatically placed onto the electoral roll. So people can simply choose not to enrol to vote. Um, as of the 30th of June 2021, the Australian Electoral Commission estimates um, that 660, six, over 660,000 Australians eligible to vote and not enrolled. So we have around 96.2% of all Australians eligible to vote who are enrolled. So 96%. However, when you look at the youth rate, these are, these are people aged 18 to 24, the rate drops to 84.5% of people enrolled to vote who are eligible. If we look broadly at Indigenous Australians across Australia, the rate drops again down to 79.3% of people who are eligible to vote, vote but not enrolled. So there is obviously a significant gap in those people who, who are able to vote but choose not to be enrolled. So whilst mandatory voting systems do ensure vast numbers of Australia of Australians will show up on polling day, it does not ensure engagement of all in, in Australians. And therefore, education and engagement programs, like those delivered here in WA, remain more important than ever. Whilst researching the paper, I came across reports from both the UK and the USA that they are increasingly considering how to counter low voter turnouts at the polls. And there have been a number of reports compiled on the subject in the UK and calls for compulsory voting. There have been, also been calls for compulsory voting to be introduced in France and Canada, amongst others, and I have found the most recent report, which um, uh, I did, didn't include in here, which was from Germany. I, from what I understand in the UK, there has been a significant shift to open the institution to citizens, um, and that is to implement strategies similar to the ones we already implement here in Western Australia, which is you know, to have a creation of dedicated team of staff whose roles are to engage the community and educate the citizens on the parliamentary process. Overall, I think the case for compulsory voting remains strong and it does result in a more engaged constituency. But we therefore have a greater responsibility to ensure that particular demographics are not left disengaged by the political process and to ensure we, remain a high, we maintain a high level of civic education. It is also clear that education and engagement programs are important across all democracies. Now, my speech is not about diversity of members of parliament per se, but it's important in, in the context of education. So diversity in politics has been part of the international conversation for many years, whether it's race, gender, age or ability. But driving interest and engagement in the parliament process is more successful if young people in particular or disengaged voters or communities can see themselves reflected in the type of people representing the parliament. It's worth noting that while I was reading through my notes yesterday, Aor did say, why have you got a photo of my family on your PowerPoint presentation? 
That's what happens when you're the first AL. <laughs> it was publicly available on the uh, Facebook site, so um, my staff uh, may have borrowed it. Thank you, AL. <laughs> A fantastic photo. Um, as American activist uh, Marion White Edelman said, you can't be what you can't see. And I do think about this quote often when I'm uh, sitting in the Legislative Council and um, we quite often have school groups coming into the public gallery while we're sitting. Um, and I know that those students um, in their public gallery can, can look down and they can see the faces of people who are Aboriginal, Asian, African amongst the members seated below. It's role models like role models like these, like Western Australia's first Aboriginal member of the Legislative Council, the Honourable Rosie Sahana. Uh, our first member, of course, of African descent, the Honourable Ayor Michael Choet, um, and our Chinese-born um, Honourable Pierre Yang MLC. It's role mo models like these members that allow young people of Western Australia to imagine, perhaps for the first time, that they could have a place in the political system. And it elevates the voices that will enable Australia as a country to move beyond simplistic and one-dimensional conversations about race. Here in WA's 41st Parliament, there are currently members born in more than 20 different countries. And the Honourable uh, Sandra Carr spoke about the gender pay gap. And in my, uh, my speech, I talk about that there is a perceived gender gap in the willingness and interest of women to run for political office. And I say perceived because it's not a case, I believe, of you know, less willing or less interest from women. It's more a case of opportunity and encouragement. So since 1921, since Edith Cowan was the first um, female member of parliament, since 1921, 114 women have been elected to the WA parliament. For some perspective, my upper house colleague, the Honourable Alana McTiernan MLC, was only the 28th woman represented to the West Australian parliament. And I still sit with, with Alana in the upper house. So she was only the 28th woman elected to parliament in Western Australia. I'm the 113th woman to be elected and we sit together in the chamber. So we've come a long way in a quick amount of time. It's also fitting that the 100th woman sworn into the parliament of Western Australia was in this year, the centenary year of Edith Cowan. 44% of WA's parliament is currently female. Now, this is largely due to the affirmative action policies of the governing WA Labor Party, and I do not say that to be partisan, but to highlight that it took a landslide win of a political party, a political party that had an affirmative action policy on gender for over 20 years, for us to even get close in achieving gender balance in this parliament. WA has also uh, has a significant age diversity. We've had a number of members in the past who've been elected while in their 20s. Um, currently, our parliament has members ranging in age from their 30s right through to their 70s. Um, it is really interesting to me um, as, a, as a new MP that at the last election, we had a significant number of women aged over 50 becoming members of parliament for the first time, um, which I really hope will, will encourage more women to be engaged in, in political life um, yeah, at any age. So by highlighting and creating education and engagement opportunities around all types of diversity, we can work, work towards overcoming apathy and disengagement amongst our current and future constituents. There is, of course, still room to do more. Whilst we have made great stride forward in diversity front, there is still more to do. We have an increasing number of LGBTQI plus members of parliament, but I do not believe yet that we have a trans or gender diverse person elected to an Australian parliament, but I'm more than happy to be um, corrected if, if we do. Similarly, we need to consider what we can do to support increased representation of people living with a disability. I've included an image here of WA Green Senator um, Jordan Stone John Steele, who sits in um, federal parliament. Um, and you may remember the media reports at the time that he faced numerous ac ac accessibility challenges when he entered federal parliament in 2017. Now, it's worth noting that he was in the federal parliament, a building built in 1998, and he faced significant challenges as a person living with a disability. Um, I'm imagining the challenges that someone would face entering a building like ours built in 1902. 
Again, if we are seeking to generally, genuinely connect and encourage voters, we must ensure our parliament genuinely reflect, reflects the diversity of our population. In closing, the WA Parliament leads the way in interesting, interactive and innovative ways to engage in our community. Whilst we face challenges going forward, the changing demographic of our voters, capturing the attention of youth in a crowded space and educating the disengaged, we have never been in a better position to do so due to the diversity of our parliament, but also our reach via digital technology. On a positive note, um, we recently had local government elections here in Western Australia. So in October 2021, WA's local government elections, which is of course our third tier of government, um, held elections. In those recent elections, we saw 19-year-old Amy Astill elected to the City of Kalgoorlie Boulder Council, one of our large regional councils in the Goldfields. In my constituency in the south of the state, 24-year-old Michaelia Love became the City of Bustleton Councillor. 26-year-old Doug Kitchen was named the Shire President of the Shire of Capel. And 30-year-old Jason de San Miguel became the city of Bunbury's youngest mayor. The city of Bunbury is our, our second largest city uh, outside of Perth. So I think uh, that might be a project for a future parliamentary research internship is to connect with these emerging young leaders and discover what role parliamentary engagement processes and civil, civics education and diversity role models placed encouraging them into political life. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. It was um, really interesting to hear about the amazing work that the Western Australian uh, Parliament is doing to uh, provide outreach and to um, really open up Parliament to the people. So that's very inspiring and I will be taking a lot of that information back home with me to the Northern Territory. I will now open it up to delegates in the room. If you have any questions for Jackie, please come to the table. Thank you. Rosemary Armitage from Tasmania. My question, your education engagement program. So with the, you're talking about apathy and people that are not engaged in the voting system. I know in Tasmania, in a lot of our schools, particularly year 11 and 12, when students are actually reaching an age of voting, we give them forms and we get them to fill out. So do you, I'll ask both my questions at the same time, if you like to save going, but do you do that in the uh, obviously education here in your schools, in your senior colleges, to encourage people to actually fill out those forms and make sure I'm, that they engage. I'm actually going to answer that by saying I'm not actually sure if we do, to be honest. Um, and my, I think about my own daughter is, is in year 12, her final year of school, so she would turn 18 on March. Um, and I don't believe that anyone contacted her at her school and gave her, said, this is how you enrol to vote. Um, Sandra Carr, you've got a son the same age. Don't, no, it wasn't given to him and I don't know that it's a public school mm. requirement either. I don't think we do. Uh, well, I certainly know in some of the private schools they do in, in Tasmania, they yeah. actually give out the forms mm. and encourage the students to fill them out and then collect them off and, and send them off because I know my own children have actually had them filled out and I just think it might be certainly mm. with your educational program. But my other question to do with compulsory voting, you were saying how many people or how many votes are invalid and uh, you know don't mm. actually count. But can you give a percentage of people that are enrolled to vote that actually don't bother, that don't end, whether it's the same for both your legislative and assembly. Oh, who, who, who face, I guess, that fine by not turning up. Well, well basically, yeah. yes, who just don't bother. Obviously, it's more difficult for us mm. in Tasmania because our elections are generally not held together mm. and our legislative council has a, a worse turnout than oh, our okay. House of Assembly. So I would have thought that yours would be similar. But I'm just wondering. Well, so because we because uh, you're actually at the same time, we're voting at the same time. So you were handed the two ballot papers. You would assume papers, that they that, yeah. would, would vote so the I, same. So I think from the and I don't have the figures to hand, but I know they're readily available. So I think at the last election, the voter turnout across Western Australia was about eighty six percent, which is fairly good. Yes, but it still shows that there's there's a significant number of people who are quite happy to cop the twenty. And they're, they're the people that are actually registered to vote as opposed to those that still got that other percentage. But, but when you go to our mining and pastoral region, in in the, particularly in the remote areas in the northwest that rate drops well under i think i think under about 77 percent um 
And what's interesting is we obviously had a, this state election in March. We we had early polling booths open for two and a half weeks. So we had a significant amount of time because the, the thought was with COVID, we wanted to space people out. So I know in the southwest electorate where I am, 45% of people had voted before polling day. So we allowed a significant amount of time. Um, but I think there's probably, if we look at the minor partial region, perhaps there needs, needs to be more work done at allowing those mobile booths and those teams that go out to remote communities to actually be, be there longer or have a longer period of engagement. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Uh, you'll come to the table. Um, I'm really quite surprised that um, um, we don't seem to know about the West Australian Electoral Commission's outreach into high school. I know that when my sons uh, my sons were in high school in Queensland mm -hmm. and the Queensland Electoral Commission would go around to all the schools, all the high schools, and um, educate young people about voting and um, provide them with the documentation to enrol provisionally so that as soon as they turned 18 they were on the on the electoral roll and that seemed to me to be a very useful form of outreach we, we might have to take the Chris, we might have to take that up with our minister yes, of education, we need to our take minister that up electoral with affairs our electoral commission yes. and it may well be the difference between a, 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 a my daughter was in the catholic school system so it may well be the difference between the catholic school system and the public school system perhaps uh, i suspect the public school system might be better at it than uh, no, no. We'll 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 have to uh, we'll have to take that on notice for our minister for education. Okay, excellent. If there are no further questions, I'd like to say, could you all join me and thank you, Jackie, for your presentation. Thank you, uh, conference delegates. You will notice that we're a little bit over time at the moment. Uh, we will take a full 15 minute break. And just a reminder to those who are participating online uh, that we will come back to uh, start just after a quarter past 11 this morning.